the way that I teach this, we're going to have to start with Jesus first. Because if we don't, at the best of times, like 30 years ago, actually from when Barb asked me, what about tongues? Okay, I studied it, and it shocked me. I, it really shocked me. I had been a tongue talker most of my Christian life. Like, I, I became a Christian at maybe 14, no, maybe earlier than that, about 12. It's funny how you can't remember. It wasn't long after that, they had me on the floor out front on the, at the altar at the Pentecostal church, hoping that I'd get the Holy Ghost. And I blubbered a little bit, and they said, He's got it! He's got it! He's got it! So I've been talking in tongues and getting better at it my whole life, until about 30 years ago. And uh, because we, as a church, began studying many of the basics of what Word of Faith was and what we needed to get rid of. And we found out that much of the Word of Faith teaching was just man-made. It had no biblical foundation whatsoever. And so we destroyed many of our formal beliefs. And then Barb came to me and said, what about tongues? And so I thought I should be fair, so I studied it. And the key to understanding any subject in the Bible, any concept, is you have to start with Jesus. That's what I think helped me the most when I went back and, and I was restudying all of the concepts that we had been taught in our group so I studied the concept of tongues this time knowing that I had to once again approach this subject with Jesus as the foundation. Now why am I saying that? Well, most people when they talk about tongues only refer to the New Testament. They'll automatically go to Acts chapter 2 They'll go to the three chapters in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Because they're assuming, you see, that they already have it figured out. So what's the difference? What happened to me is that I no longer believed that I had everything figured out. That's why when Barb asked me, at that time, they were, you know, attended the same church. With the, the church that we were bringing out of charismatic beliefs. And the reason I thought it was a fair question is because I had restudied everything that I formally believed. I just gave it a fair chance. I thought, okay, just like everything else, I've had to start all over again. I had to start from scratch, realize that Jesus Christ is the truth about God, number one, and then every doctrine or every belief that we had had to be re-examined from that foundation, Jesus Christ, as the rock, the solid foundation upon which you would build the people of God. So... I re-examined it, and I can remember 30 years ago, too, what came out of that study. It shocked me, but it didn't take me long to catch on. That this so-called speaking in tongues that we have today as a modern sign and wonder, that, that is not what Jesus did. Okay? And so when I got a hold of the truth about tongues, that was 30 years ago, and I tried teaching a seminar, and I had a session with a whole bunch of people attending, and uh, just about all of them went away mad. One lady in particular, there were several people there I knew, they just walked out after I was done. They just walked out. They didn't even want to talk to me. And we were good friends for years and years and years. So this one lady came up to me and said, 
I don't care what the Bible says, I'm going to hang on to my version of tongues. Okay? Now, we're going to have to rebuild, guys, from the foundation up. Why am I saying Jesus first? Well, let's go to Isaiah, and I'll show you why. Isaiah chapter 28. We've been in this chapter a lot, so you know it well. Let's go to verse 11, first of all, and then I'm going to read some of the context. It says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Stammering lips and another tongue. Let's, uh, first of all, g give some definitions to these words, okay? The word tongue in the Hebrew can mean the physical tongue, but that is not all that it represents. It represents the movement of the tongue when you're speaking. Your tongue moves, doesn't it? Touches the top of your mouth, touches your teeth. You, you don't even think about it. You just talk. Your lips are moving. There's, there's a lot going on when you're speaking. But the Hebrew mind paid attention to this. They said, what, what is this? What, when, you're, when you're talking, your tongue is moving and your lips are moving and, and your, your vo vocal cords, your throat is giving a sound, right? And so this word tongue can mean that. It can also mean this. It can mean a language, a language that is identifying a certain group of people, right? Now, stammering, it says, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. The word stammering is another word to make fun of the way someone else speaks. And it doesn't have to be a foreign language. You know that as a child, you probably made fun of other languages. I did. Like up till I can remember when I was five or six. And if someone spoke Italian, I would try to imitate them. Right? I had probably no idea what I was saying, but I thought I was sounding Italian. Or Chinese. The Chinese people down at the grocery store. I would imitate them. Right? That's what children do. But the word stammering actually means to mock or make fun of the way someone now speaks. What we're going to do is lay the foundation again. This a verse, Isaiah 28, 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he, who's the he? Jesus. It's Jesus. How do we know this? Because of the rest of the chapter. Chapter 28 is a prophetic chapter about Christ. Verse 2 says, behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one. That's Christ. Then in verse 16, it says, Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth in him, Paul says. That's interesting. Because in the book of Isaiah, it just says, He that believeth shall not make haste. Paul taught, he that believeth in him shall not be ashamed or confounded. So we know that this whole chapter is talking about Christ. This is a prophecy about him. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. I told my sister about this months ago, and she was shocked. She said, you're kidding. There's a prophecy about Jesus speaking in tongues. I said, yeah. Well, she said, where is it fulfilled? And I told her, it's on every page. When Jesus spoke, you're reading his parable language full of prophetic imagery, Old Testament imagery that he told in parables. 
We need to understand this because many people, many Christians especially, think that Jesus told little stories. If you believe that Jesus' parables are just little stories, then you'll believe as a pastor or a teacher that you can tell little stories too with the same effect as Jesus' stories. No. Your stories are not inspired by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. But Jesus' parables are biblical parables pulled together to tell a story that is actually the Word of God. Remember, Jesus is the Word made flesh. Now, sometimes we have trouble with the word flesh, so I'll just say this. Jesus is the Word made alive, embodied in a man, a man who is completely merged with the Word of God. He and the Word of God are one. So we're looking at a prophecy here, and I'm amazed in all the 30 years I have understood this. Why haven't I heard preachers talk about tongues? Why don't they go this far back? Why don't they go to Isaiah and start with Christ? I don't know. Well, maybe it's because it's for that time and not for all. Right. Because that's the way we've been, we've been trained as Christians to read the Old Testament and say, this is a message for those people at that time. It doesn't apply to us. I read another scripture yesterday, I think, that says the word of God is forever. It's forever. It applies to us forever. We're not in a different age. That's another false teaching that we've been fed. That we're in a different age. The New Testament, it's a different age. No, it isn't. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. It doesn't do away with the Old Testament. Jesus said, I've come to fulfill, not do away with. He is the fulfillment. So we have to realize that, yes, Jesus spoke in parables because it is the language of God. Now, take the definition that I gave you. The word tongue means a language or a dialect that identifies a group of people. Well, over the past few months, have we developed a language that you don't hear other people saying? Where did the language come from? It came from the Word of God. It came out of the Bible. The more we study together, learning the parabolic meaning of words. The word of God is words. What we've done, we've done so many word studies, and there's many, many more. We're thrilled to do a word study. Why? Because we have found that each word is full of meaning. It's a treasure, full. And it doesn't matter which word we study. The parabolic meaning of the words out of the Word of God are not exactly how we use the words in the world. Now, the world makes up its own parables. Mixed metaphors. Mixed metaphors. Instead of doing the proper metaphors, they're mixing them together. Yeah. So many. <laughs> There's so many. Like, the world has actually adopted metaphors out of the Bible and have changed it to mean something in their own lives. I'll give you an example. Uh, Jesus taught in parables. In other words, he, he taught in a language of his own. He spoke in stammering lips and another tongue. So here's a good example. This, a simple one. I'll choose a simple one that you follow my thought. Wolves in sheep's clothing. He said, Beware of false prophets, for they will come to you as wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, 
Instead of going through the rest of the Bible to find out similar language, to understand the meaning, here's what we do. We guess. And what, what happens is we take a parable of Christ and we then imagine a wolf in sheep's clothing. And the only thing that our head can think of is a picture of a wolf with, we picture a wolf with sheep's skin and a sheep's head trying to look like one of the sheep. See what we've done? And uh, I, I remember looking through the internet and sure enough, the world and the church believes that's the fulfillment of what Jesus said, a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's because we've not used the word of God to interpret the word of God. When you go back into the Old Testament and you find all of these scriptures about, you know, the sheep not being fed and the sheep are losing their lives, they're dying, because the shepherds are not feeding them. They're eating them. Uh, Ezekiel is my favorite. Ezekiel chapter 34 says, Woe to the shepherds. Then it goes and it says, You clothe yourselves with the wool, but you feed not my sheep. In other words, you are living off of these people. Because who in the world is God talking about? He's not talking about physical sheep. He's talking about his people. What the leaders have done to harm the people of God. It says, you, woe to the shepherds, prophesy against the shepherds because they clothe themselves with the wool, but do not feed my sheep you live off of them. Now you go back to Jesus' parable. Wolves in sheep's clothing then, according to following the thought out of the Old Testament, are shepherds. They have clothed themselves with the wool because they're living off of the people, oppressing the people, not teaching the people, not leading them to green pastures, which is the word of God. So as soon as they keep doing that, it's just another way of them to gain. Well, yeah, it's gain. Mm -hmm. They've gone after the rewards of Balaam. They're hirelings. That's another parable that Jesus spoke about. A hireling doesn't care. If an enemy comes after the sheep, again, we're not talking about physical sheep. We're talking about an enemy comes after the people of God, the hireling will run. He says, I'm just here for the money. I am not fighting off a bear or a lion. But David was a man that would. That's why Jesus is of the seed of David. Jesus is called the great shepherd. He leads us to green pastures. What are the green pastures? It's the richness of the word of God to feed us, to feed our mind, spirit, soul, heart. I don't divide those anymore. You can't feed your mind without feeding your heart and your spirit. Your whole inner being is who you are. So back to this idea. Now, let's go to the context now. We read Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Let's go back to verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Now, who's the he again? It's Christ. Whom shall he teach knowledge? To whom shall he make to understand doctrine? And it tells you who. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. What's that? That's a little child. Now, this is another parable that we've got wrong. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. I tell you what, this one has been messed up the most. Because people say that being born again 
is an experience. They can put a date on it. I was born again in March 5th, 1963, whatever. No, you weren't. You know how I can tell? Because you're not teachable. Being born again means you become a little child. Even though Nicodemus was a leader, Jesus was saying to him, you must become a little child. Why? Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. That's a little child. That's the attitude you have to have in order to be taught by Jesus. Now, this subject alone, talking about tongues, I am not going to give people some mind-blowing facts. You have to be teachable from the beginning. Jesus taught people, and they walked away. He said things constantly in parables. In fact, in Matthew chapter 13, it says, He spoke to them in parables, and he did not speak without a parable. That means every time he opened his mouth to teach, like it says here, to teach knowledge and to make to understand doctrine, he opened his mouth with parables. Why? Because the whole word of God is written in parabolic language. Now, you've been harmed by leaders who say to you, when you read the Bible, you have to le read it literally. Now, you and I know over the past few months, going over the language of the Bible. If you get into words, like we are interested in words, if you get into the words and you love word studies, you'll soon find that those words are not literal. Every word of God has depth of meaning. So what happens is they'll say, uh, I have to read this literally. That is what messed you up in the first place. You have to love the Word of God as words that have meaning, depth, layers. And the more you study, in fact, the word tongues, I've been studying tongues for 30 years, if you understand what the word means, then when you read, you can actually put other words in there that are synonyms to the word tongue. See, we become mm, limited because we can't seem to say the word tongue without reading the word tongue. But there's other words that fit there. Another language another dialect. You know, see, here again, you're reading literally because your mind is screaming. You're saying, well, another language would be Japanese or Swahili. No. The Word of God is a language. You have to learn that language because that's the language that Jesus spoke to us in. We cannot assume that we're guessing right. What do most people use as a uh, measurement of whether they're on track or not? Men. Other men? What other men say? Mm -hmm. Yeah? How they feel. I feel this is right. It, it makes me feel better. It makes me feel better, so it must be right. See? We've been trained already to use the wrong measurement. We're supposed to use the Word of God as our standard of measurement, and especially Jesus Christ as the Word of God made alive. He is our standard of measurement. Within this same chapter, he starts teaching, this is how you are taught by Jesus. 
Whom shall he teach knowledge? And it goes on to say this, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. What? Why is he repeating it? This is very important. This is important. This is how you learn. Concept upon concept, precept upon precept, thought upon thought, meaning upon meaning, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. If you think I'm going to sit here and challenge tongues with some great mind-blowing teaching, you're not going to learn a thing. Because you don't respect the Word of God enough. You respect your feelings. You respect your ability. For those that so-called speak in tongues in the modern sense, you haven't learned a thing. Because they'll say, when I speak in tongues, I build myself up. Yes, yourself. You build yourself up. Not about you. It's not about you. Yes. Okay, for many, many years as a charismatic preacher, one of my jobs, I thought, was to pray for all the believers in the church. I would scream in tongues every day for hours. There was a favorite spot of mine. I'd go out into the bush over by... There's a small town outside called Clyde. And on the other side of Clyde, there's a little dirt road that goes to a little lake. I'd go out there, and I would scream in tongues for hours. Do you know why I went out there to scream in tongues for hours? Because one day, I was in the church. I was in the church building, screaming in tongues, intercession and everything else that we call it I was screaming I was groaning I was crying and I was just for a moment I kind of sat in the corner of the church and the RCMP pulled out to the front door <laughs> luckily it was locked but they were peering in why I think the neighbors had called them and someone is dying in that building. I hear screaming. I was so embarrassed, I didn't go and answer the door and let them in. Because I was hidden down in a corner in the dark. I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I can't pray here anymore. I've got to go out in the wilderness. So I would go out in the wilderness and scream and pray in tongues for hours. And scare all the wolves. <laughs> scare the wolves, the squirrels, the eagles, the rabbits. I thought that I was a spiritual warrior. And people backed me up on that thought. They said, yeah, Ted, you're a warrior. I could hear it from you all the time. Even when I sang... You know, I'd go travel, we'd go to Europe, and I'd get chances to sing and play in churches. And they'd all come up to me and say, oh, you're a warrior. How did I get attracted into uh, Word of Faith in the first place? Is I went to a church that was Word of Faith because I had been invited to sing. So do you remember that big anthem song back in the 70s? It was, He's Alive. Um, Dolly Parton sang it. And many Christians were singing this song at that time. I had this big, grandiose music tape that, uh, that I would use as backup. And I would sing with my big voice, and I'd say, He's Alive! And... Uh, these people came up to me after I sang in this Word of Faith church. And they said, man, while you were singing that, I could see the glory of God all around you. I'm telling you, that impressed me. Because I was carnal and immature. Really? You see the glory of God all around me? 
They didn't see anything. But the words got me good. I was sucked in very quickly into that word of faith doctrine because of flattery. I am not challenging the concept of speaking in tongues because I am a person that's never experienced it. I'm coming from the position where I was a warrior in tongues every day of my life. I loved screaming in tongues. There was some euphoria that I experienced every time. And I'd go out there for hours and pace and scream and holler and yell and until I felt I was done. And I would beat up the devil. I'd beat him something fierce. That's what's going on in my head. That I'm a warrior and I'm beating the devil to death. And I'd come away from that session going, done again. I am so good. But I was not basing my concept of speaking in tongues on Christ. How did he speak in tongues? Because people's mind may be screaming. They say, there's a prophecy of Jesus speaking in tongues. Where is it fulfilled? Well, it's not fulfilled in just one place. It's every time he opened his mouth, he spoke in such a way that people could mock and reject what he was saying. It's a test, actually. You're either going to be like the disciples and say, what did you mean by the sower sows the seed? Please explain the parable. You either ask him that or you walk away. Like in John 6, when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood because I am the bread from heaven. The people walked away, all his disciples, except for the 12. He had many disciples then. And he had crowds that came across the lake from where he fed them. 5,000 he fed. They crossed the lake. And then he declared to them, you're not here because I was teaching you from words of heaven. You're here because I fed you with physical food. And you've crossed the lake not to hear my words, but to be fed again physically. In other words, you don't get it. I am the bread from heaven. You eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's parabolic language. Many people walked away that day and said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Stammering lips in another tongue. What was he saying? Well, you have to be on Jesus' side to ask that question. What was he meaning? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. He is saying, you have to take in my life. That's what blood means throughout the Bible. What did Jesus mean by that? He's saying, take in my life as food, your food. Everything I've said, everything I've done is the truth that you need to be free from the flesh. But you see, they've crossed the lake to feed their flesh. And Jesus rebuked them for that. Finally, he turns to his disciples and says, are you going to leave me as well? And Peter says, Again, what he said in Matthew chapter 16, he says it again in John chapter 6. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Where else are we going to go? We're that committed. I'm not going back to fishing. I'm not following the crowds. I'm choosing their narrow gate. I'm going to stick with you, Jesus. 
Now, I may not fully understand what you just said, but I desperately want to know. Because I believe you have the words of life, he said. Yeah, sure, this might be a hard saying. It is stammering lips in another tongue. It's a language of Christ himself, of the word of God. But Peter is saying, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to get it. Even if I have to learn precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, I'm going to learn. Because I believe you have the words of life. Now it's interesting. Going back to Isaiah 28, 11, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. How's that fulfilled? I just told you. Jesus spoke in a language that people could reject. Mm -hmm. They walked away. This language is too hard. The words you're speaking are too hard to understand. You have to see how this scripture is fulfilled in Christ first before you even can go to Acts chapter 2 and the three chapters in 1 Corinthians. You can't understand what Paul's talking about unless you understand how Jesus fulfilled this scripture. They would not hear. You see, he's not speaking a language that, that lacks their words. He is using words in a different sense, yes, in a parabolic sense. But you have to be willing to stick with Jesus until you understand that language. That's why the way that charismatics teach you, just come up the front, we'll lay hands on you and everything will be better. That's not what Jesus is teaching you. It's precept upon precept, precept upon precept. That's how you're transformed into the image of Christ. Nobody can lay hands on you and do that work that the Word of God can do. They would not hear. And then it repeats. They would not hear, but the word of the Lord was unto them. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept. I like the end of this. He's saying the same thing he said before. And then he says that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Listen. The word of God is written in such a way that if you're not hungry for it, it will snare you. It will trap you. If you want to interpret the words of God carnally, you are caught because you've chosen that track. There's a wide gate and a narrow gate. And when Jesus says, few there be that find that gate, he means few. I can't imagine how many people that hear this message will go, uh, I don't like precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Um, too lazy for that. I don't want to go through that process. I hardly even read my Bible. And you're talking about words upon words upon words upon words. You're talking about word studies. You're talking about reading the Bible in detail. I don't even have time to read a few verses. You have to start over. You know, when it comes to the concept of tongues, people will say the charismatics have it all messed up. No, I'm going to say the charismatics have it all messed up, yes. But the evangelicals have it all messed up too. Because they, they'll say this, well, speaking in tongues is like speaking in Japanese or Swahili. No, you're not getting it either. It's learning the language of God. 
It has nothing to do with the languages of people on this earth. I know originally the word tongue can, just like you say, he spoke in the native tongue. We know what that means. But you see, Jesus is using the words, and Paul is using the words, in parabolic form. That means there, there's more depth to it than what you're guessing it is. If you don't want to learn precept upon precept, precept upon precept, it will trap you. I was just thinking about the, the woman at the well. When Jesus said she, she wanted him, or he asked her if uh, she could dr draw some water for him. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'll give you water that you'll never thirst again. She didn't get it. Right, because it's parabolic again. Yeah. But spiritual too. Yeah. See, sometimes we think parabolic is, well, that's just a pretend story. No. The parables of Jesus are spirit. And truth. And truth. Yeah. You have to learn the language to learn the truth. Yeah. What does he mean by water? What's he mean by living? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then he said to her, finally she admits, well, I can tell you're, you're definitely a prophet. And she said, we Samaritans, we take pride in that we worship here at this mountain. But you Jews say you must worship at that mountain at Jerusalem. Jesus already had been teaching the disciples, cast this mountain into the sea. What, what mountain is he talking about? This is another parable that Christians have misused. They say, oh, the mountain represents hardships in my life. It's not about you. It's about what Jesus is talking about. Which mountain is he standing by when he says, cast this mountain. If you have faith in God, you can cast this mountain into the sea. Which mountain? The mountain upon which Jerusalem is built. See? It's no longer the foundation. Jesus said to Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, my temple. Upon what? On the revelation of Christ. He's the foundation. He said to the lady at the well, there's coming a time when you will neither worship God in that mountain in Jerusalem or in this mountain in Samaria. You will worship God in spirit and in truth. A lot of Christians have built the wrong foundation. They've made their experiences their foundation, their own thoughts their foundation. No, the revelation of Christ has to be understood that's your foundation. That's why I keep saying, you have to start again. You have to be like Nicodemus was asking, what must I do? And Jesus said, you must be born again. It is not an experience. It is a moment of humility where you say, I am going back to the basics. I'm going to be like a little child and be taught again, precept upon precept, until I get it. I'm willing to go back and start over. But I know many people that hear me and say, no, are you kidding? I know all there is to know already. Why should I go back and start over again? Okay. Then don't. <laughs> then don't. See where it gets you. I read the Bible for five years and I didn't find a single thing wrong with my doctrine. <laughs> the old pastor told me that. Yes, selective reading and selective hearing. You can see why this is not going to be one session. Because we haven't even touched Acts chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 13, 14. But we're, we're going to. Okay. 
Yeah, because you got to start start with this foundation, start in Isaiah, and then you begin to understand when we go into Acts, mm-hmm. the Corinthians. Well, I'm I'm sure there's going to be people that even hear this part and say, "Oh my goodness, my mind is screaming." Mm-hmm. One lady wrote us and says, "Wow." I've never even heard anything like this. And that was that video we did that's, we had to turn it into black and white because the sun was shining through the window and my, my face was completely whited out, gone. That was 10 months ago. 10 months ago. It was a terrible video. Yeah. The sound was fine. Yeah. The audio was good. Yeah, once you get this concept, I started uh, studying Hebrews today. And what does that start with? You know, uh, God in sundry times in diverse manners spoke in the past to the fathers by the prophets, mm-hmm. as in these last days spoken to us by the Son. You, you see that in a totally different way now. Then I went back to Numbers, where it said he spoke to Moses plainly, face to face. Mm hmm. He spoke in parables, and that was back in numbers. Yeah, it's quite fascinating. I love it, Barb. Yeah. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, the Old Testament wasn't relevant. Jesus wouldn't have used it so much. Yeah. Or the apostles. The apostles, yeah. You know, sometimes when you read Paul, it's quote after quote after quote, and the only thing that separates the Old Testament verses is and again, and again, and again. Well, if you really think about it, you, you listen to the prophets. They spoke in parables all the time. Yes. What's that, Barb? What did he call it in um, dark speeches? What they called it. He spoke in dark speeches. Yeah, dark sayings, parables. That's uh, Psalm 78. And then uh, all the... You're, you're referring to Moses, I think, right? Yeah, I was looking at Moses and then the few cross-references for that, right? Right. You, you, mm-hmm. you can see what I'm saying easily now, right? You're, you, I'm saying we have to learn the language of God and then speak it. Yeah, yeah. Speak it and then, like you said, we're responsible to speak it, but we're not responsible to make them understand. No, they have to decide for themselves. Yes. Yeah. Now, the only thing that we'll get into later, when we get into 1 Corinthians, um, there is the responsibility of teaching, prophesying the words. In other words, prophesying means revealing the meaning of the words. When we get into it, that's the responsibility of a teacher. I'm doing that right now. But, you know, uh, people that are listening to me will say, he's not making sense. Well, you might as well say, he's speaking in tongues. Yes, I am. Because I'm speaking the concepts of God. From his word. The people that say that are, are people that their hearts have waxed cold. Yes. Well, they're they're following men anyway. So they like those men, but they don't like that man. Yeah. See, what a, a the pastor's responsibility, okay? The by the word the word pastor means pasture. You can see that. What does the pastor do? He leads the sheep to the green pastures. Now, does he cut the grass and feed the sheep at one at a time? No. The sheep eat. I'm leading you to the green pastures. You eat. 
Now, you can either eat just by my teaching, or you can read the Word of God and take it in yourselves. But I'm giving you principles of how to read. Because yeah. we have many, many, many assumptions that we've been taught that we have to unlearn and start over and go back to these words and then say, Jesus, explain to me the parable of the sower. Explain to me the meaning of this word. You're the foundation. Then I'm going to lay the foundation. I'm going to read the word of God from scratch. And let the word of God teach me what the word of God is meaning. I'm going to give you a tip, one that I gave to Mark. Okay? And Mark was saying that as he's reading, he says, every time I come across this word tongue, my mind goes, what? <laughs> so I said to him, well, substitute the word tongue for the meaning of the word. Substitute it for language of a particular group of people. Think of that group of people as the believer. Okay? So as you're reading, you're going to say, Oh, Paul spoke in a language more than you all. The language of what? The language of Scripture. He's not speaking to you in words that don't make sense, but like on purpose. He's teaching you the meaning of the words of God. Now, he could just, like, I know I could too. Like, I could just rattle off, let's say I just start rattling off a whole bunch of parabolic images. Like, I could remember uh, when we were t talking about this, I said in the video, I could just come out and blurt out and say, the whore is the church of the last days. And I said to Mark, what good is that? And we edited it out of the video. It was blank. Why? Because I knew I had to teach it first. I just knew that. Mm -hmm. You can't just, you know, lay on a parabolic image, a spiritual prophetic image on someone without explaining the meaning. Like Paul says in, in uh you know, as the as the unbelievers come in, they're going to say, you're nuts. Well, one day, Mark and I were standing in a foyer talking about wolves and sheep. If my mother or father would have come by, they would have thought, what in the world are you talking about? You're speaking in a language I don't understand. Because we were talking about leaders. And we know exactly what we're talking about. But someone else that would have been overhearing that conversation, <laughs> talking about, you know, shepherds and sheep and wolves and, you know, what to feed them and so on. And you think, what What are you talking about? You, got, you guys got a farm? No, no. What are you talking about? Well, we're talking about the word. What? See, the concepts of the word have to be taught. I was thinking of it this way. It's a language within a language. Mm -hmm. Similar to the man that buys a field. And he has to dig for that pearl. Yes. He has to dig for that treasure. Mm -hmm. And the word of God is like that too. Yeah. Yeah. We have to dig for these meanings. So it's not just a language on top. There's a language beneath there that we need to understand. Yeah. And it's not hidden very far. No. No. But it's hidden just enough to thwart off the flesh. Because the flesh says, I don't get it. Yeah. Not interested. Yeah. I'm sweaty. I don't want to get sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have to dig for it. It should be right on top. Yeah. But the person that understands their treasure there, you're going to dig a little. Sure. And when you find that treasure, you're going to sell everything. <laughs> Yes, because everything else doesn't compare to what you're finding. Yeah, it doesn't matter. No. No.